Do, do I have to hit continue? Yeah. So uh, thank you very much, Joanna. I want to start by congratulating Beverly McKeon on being elected fellow of the AIAA. And now I want to start about my talk, Unsteadiness Boundary in Supersonic Double Cone Flow. I want to thank Peter Jacobs, Rowan Gollan, David Gildfeind of the University of Queensland, who have helped me enormously with the software that I'm going to use for this work. And it's been partially supported by the Air Force Army. Now, why doesn't it go to the next slide? Here it is. So the double cone in supersonic flow. Here is a, a model. Can you see my cursor? I'll start over here in the black so that you can see it move. This is the first cone of length L1 and angle theta1. And this is the axis of the model. And here is the second cone of length L2 and angle theta2. Uh, which is larger than theta one, usually in flows of interest. Usually we pick the first cone to be such that the shock wave on the first cone is attached and the flow after it is supersonic. And that the second uh, shock wave on the second cone, cone two shock, is detached and strong and causes the boundary layer that arrives on the first cone to separate. This separation deflects the flow and causes a second shock, uh, a third shock, a separation shock, which interacts then with this cone two shock. And also the reattachment point of the separation is here and causes a so-called reattachment shock. This is usually followed by something that we call a shock train, a supersonic shock train, which I have only indicated the beginning of because it's a pretty tedious to draw all these little shock waves. And so this shock train often penetrates all the way through the sonic line, which terminates the subsonic region in front of cone two. This is one of the manifestations of uh, steady flow over a double cone. Another manifestation of uh, the double cone is shown in the next slide, but before I do that, here are the three geometric parameters, theta one, theta two, and the length ratio, L2 divided by L1. The second steady manifestation of the double cone flow is when the separation happens very much further upstream, in which case it is quite small, but it also generates a supersonic shock train, which sometimes makes it all the way through this subsonic region to the sonic line. So this problem has been studied a hell of a lot. And one particular manifestation of it is the special case when theta one is small and the second angle is 90 degrees. This is what we call a spiked body. One of the first people to notice this pulsating unsteadiness in such a case was Professor Austin Mayer of Cambridge, 1952 at Mach number one and a half. Uh, and then at that time, uh, John Stollery started, built together with Maul and Belcher built a uh, gun tunnel for hypersonic flow. And John Stollery was always very interested in practical hypersonic flows. So he wanted to see whether a spike body would, the spike could reduce the heat flow, heat uh, load and the drag of a blunt body. So he got David Mall to do his PhD in 1960 on this topic. And he got some very nice photos in hypersonic flow. Then came uh, Colin Wood, who did the same thing, but with not a flat face, but a cone as the second body, which is my problem. And uh, so David Wood was the first to recognize the importance of the detachment angle of the second cone, which I'll come back to. Then Mike Holden, also a graduate from Imperial College, actually in between those two was, uh, was I. 
uh, and he also worked on this problem extensively. Then uh, Kenworthy did his work at the von Kármán Institute, an extensive detailed piece of work in which he did all sorts of stuff like changing the length of the spike during the run and observing some hysteresis effects. And these two actually are pictures from Kenworthy's thesis, two phases of the pulsating unsteadiness. Then Brian Richards, also a contemporary of Holden, Honung, and uh, actually uh, Schul Park as well at Imperial College. He did, he computed this particular flow of Kenworthy's in great detail and showed some very nice stuff. Panaras, Drikakis had some theoretical stuff and they, you know, they, they, they all had these uh, somewhat arm waving theories about the mechanisms by which they used phrases like the energetic shear layer hypothesis and stuff like that, which I just couldn't understand. So the, this is where I start. Take fact one, a spiked blunt body exhibits pulsating unsteadiness. Fact two, however, if theta one is theta two, then the flow is known to be steady. So we conclude that there must be a boundary between steady and unsteady flow in the theta one, theta two space. Question one, where is that boundary? Question two, what other parameters matter? And if we take viscous ideal gas flow, we expect the unsteadiness boundary to depend on seven parameters. These three geometrical ones, the Mach number, the Reynolds number, specific heat ratio and wall temperature ratio. So this is a huge parameter space, which we hope to curtail somewhat later. So, uh, but first let me introduce the detachment angle of a cone. If we take a single cone at uh, hypersonic Mach number eight, let's say gamma 1.4 and an angle 50 degrees, then we get a straight attached shock with supersonic flow downstream of it. But if we increase the angle, let's say to 65 degrees, then we get a detached bow shock, which is curved and downstream of which the flow is subsonic. Here is the sonic line. And so in between these two angles, there is something called the detachment angle, which I call theta D, and which was recognized by David Wood uh, to be important in spike body flow, which is called theta 2D here. Now, the, an interesting feature of hypersonic flows is that many cases exist where the Mach number and the specific heat ratio don't separately influence the problem, but only this function of them, which is the density ratio, inverse density ratio across a normal shock. For example, Hayes and Probstein derived a, a nice approximation for the detachment angle, which is a very simple function of epsilon. And this is uh, very good, even down to as low as a Mach number of two, for which epsilon is 0 0.375, and the error there is only one and a half degrees. But at Mach four, we go down to 6.6 .6 degrees and Mach 8.2 degrees. But so this already suggests a simplification of the parameter space. Now let's go back to my problems. And I have suggested this problem to many CFD specialists, because I thought it was a good thing to try, but nobody picked it up. So in August 2019, I visited the University of Queensland and attended a presentation of, by Peter Jacobs on his software called Alma 4. I was so thrilled with this software in this presentation that I said, can I have it? And so we installed it while I was there in my office machine and I've worked on it since. We have now added it to the tools of the Austin Group and it's uh, absolutely useful for it. And uh, we installed it, thank you, Joel Lawson on Titan, which has 40 cores and Kiwi with 80 cores. 
and three graduate students are already using it. So after we got Alma and I did some other stuff with it, I decided to tackle the double cone myself. Here are some examples of what we've done so far with Alma 4. Here is a computation of an expansion tube. Here is the contact surface between the shocked acceleration gas and the shocked and expanded test gas. And it's distorted instead of being normal to the tube. This is the axis of the tube at the bottom. Instead of being normal to the tube, it's deformed by the viscous boundary layer on the wall. This is a temperature distribution, hot, cold, 700 degrees, 3000 degrees. And here is the effect of the viscosity on the test conditions in the expansion tube. Here, the inviscid one, time interval between shock and contact surface in the acceleration gas, large. Here, the viscous one, smaller, not uniform. And during the test time, we also don't have such absolutely uniform flow, but pretty good. Another computation that I did for uh, in preparation of an experiment, the guys from Stanford have brought the laser diagnostics, laser spectroscopy to the T5 shock tunnel. And in a week or so, they will start an experiment on this cylinder, which is, is in a flow of five kilometers per second. And this is, uh, of course, dissociation and vibrational non-equilibrium. Here is a distribution of the vibrational temperature, which is very important because that's what they use for in nitric oxide. And it turns out this preparation was pretty useful because the profile along here is absolutely beautifully suited for their experiments. As we can see here, this is the profile, body, shock, 30 millimeters. And this is the translational temperature, vibrational temperature, NO concentration, and density. So we have nice concentration of NO here to measure and non-equilibrium between the two temperatures. And this is good because we can also spatially resolve it nicely because uh, the resolution of the instrumentation is about a millimeter. And finally, uh, another example is this of a slender cone surrounded by a wedge-shaped ring to generate a shockwave boundary layer interaction, laminar shockwave boundary layer interaction. This is a color Schlieren with a horizontal knife edge superimposed with streamlines. And you know, you can really learn quite a bit by looking at the deflection of the streamlines, the separation shock, the reattachment shock, and the structure of the separated region and stuff like that. So let me come back to my computational task. I chose five conditions, all with uh, perfect gas nitrogen, except one with thermally perfect carbon dioxide. I have here the gas, the model, the pressure, the temperature, the velocity, the Mach number, L1, the Reynolds number, and the attachment angle, as well as epsilon. So th the reason why I chose this CO2 condition is that it has a very much larger second cone detachment angle. So that the range of detachment angles is from 41 to 65, which is good because we know the importance of the detachment angle. Condition A and A prime differ only in the pressure. So this is to check the effect of Reynolds number in a small way. And all are at high Mach number except here four and two. D is at four and two. Now it, the computation, I divide the domain into 32 blocks. And because I have 32 processes. And what I do is I cluster the grid heavily toward the wall in order to resolve the boundary layer better. 
So that's the grid. And one of the things you have to do, of course, with CFD is that you have to check whether the re resolution is good enough. So I have a base grid here. And this is uh, once refined by uh, increasing the number of cells by a factor of four. And second, by refined by increasing the number of cells relative to the base grid by an, of a factor of nine. So you see that there is not really any significant difference between these, except you can see that the shock train is a little better defined in the final grid. A more sensitive test is the resolution is the is the boundary layer. And uh, what I do is I take at 20 millimeters from the tip, which is a fifth of that hundred millimeters. I take a profile of the boundary layer, and that is shown here with the three resolutions. Here is the green is the velocity uh, up to about two kilometers per second. And he, in red is the temperature from 300 to 2000 degrees or so. The square symbols indicate the base grid resolution. So here's the first point, second point, third point. The triangular symbols represent the four times refined grid and the full line represents the finest grid. So you can see that the this uh, satisfies the resolution test pretty well as well. I should say that this point here, uh, the closest point in the base grid is at about 24, y plus equals 24. This is y plus equals 12, and the green is y plus equals six. Uh, no. 24 divided by three is eight. But it seems to be okay to use the base grid. Another test is in a violently unsteady flow, but this is again fine grid, first refinement, second refinement, and the temperature distribution. But you can see that there are some small differences in this, but you have to remember that because you have a finer resolution, the time step is different here than it is here and also here. And so to catch exactly the right time is not so easy and the differences may actually be because we don't catch exactly the same phase. So what's my strategy? The base grid is 3,600 cells per block with 32 blocks. And the resolution test, we change these 115,000 cells to a half a million and also to a million. For most purposes, in particular for our test of unsteadiness, this is okay. I know that in high enthalpy reacting cold wall flows with also species diffusion and all that stuff, you need much finer grids. So this fact that we can get away with this space grid is important since in order to cover this, this space, I need 300 computations and each takes about 10 hours. So the strategy is to use the base grid and make spot checks with the finer grids. Okay, let me first of all show you an example of the pulsating unsteadiness in the case D with a sharp tip and uh, length ratio 0.5. So the spike is uh, one degree and the second cone angle is 90 degrees. And what we show here is a clear an image with in which the density gradient is uh, the magnitude of the density gradient is used for the color. Superimposed are streamlines in white. 
and you can see, actually, I want to show this a little bigger. You can see that I haven't drawn the sonic line in this because there are so many sonic lines that it confuses things. Now I've done it. What I wanted to show is that there is a, a, a line here along which the stream tube area is a minimum so that this is like a sonic throat for each of the stream tubes and the sonic line. And it's a, in, the, in a true sense of the word, it's a bottleneck. Okay, what's happening here? Vorticity is generated at the tip of the wedge by the no slip condition. It stays within a thin boundary layer until a shock comes along and detaches, separates the flow and the vorticity comes off and gets accumulated in this vortex ring. This is a vortex ring. Remember that this is an axisymmetric flow, so the, this is like a donut around the axis. And the vortex ring grows and grows. And because the vortex ring has the sense that wants it, so that it wants to propagate to the left wants to propagate to the left and that keeps it there. It also doesn't like to be stretched, so that also keeps it there. And there is this bottleneck here of sonic bottleneck which prevents it from going over the, over the shoulder. But as the vortex ring grows, it pushes the bow shock forward and increases the bottleneck area and then that allows it to flop over the edge and so the process starts again and the new little vortex starts here vortex ring and grows and grows and keeps stay, being trapped until it pushes the shock wave forward opens up the bottleneck and flops over the edge now let me show you a video of this I have to do this and do this and this. Vortex ring grows, opens up, flops. Vortex ring grows, opens up, flops. Isn't that beautiful? Okay, you can see how suddenly I start the flow. I, it's a very impulsive start. But in a steady condition, it, after, after about 800 microseconds, it's, or actually less than that, it's 80 microseconds, it's steady. Now, let me go back to the talk here. Uh, view full screen mode now let's see what happens if the flow is uh, is invisit also we can do two things because the generation of vorticity happens because of the no slip condition we can remove this no slip condition and maintain viscosity and heat conduction or we can remove the no slip condition and remove what is uh, viscosity and heat conduction. Both are done in this slide, where we see that on the left, we have with, without no slip and viscous. And on the right, we have without no slip and inviscid. And these two are the same and steady. So what causes the whole unsteadiness is the no slip condition. Now we, we can, so what, what it depends on, what this whole unsteadiness depends on is the availability of vorticity generated at the tip. Well, we can generate vorticity at the tip another way. We can use the baroclinic torque. I like to explain this to myself every time. And so this is the way I explain it. If you take a circular element of fluid, 
and you have a pressure field, then the, all the little elements of pressure forces act at right angles to the surface, and therefore they act through the geometric center. That means that their sum also acts through the geometric center and points down the pressure gradient. If at the same time we have a density gradient, then the center of mass is displaced from the geometric center by a distance which is proportional to the density gradient and in the direction of the density gradient. That means that there is a torque acting around the center of mass, which is given by the cross product of these two, at least proportional to it. And so we had a uh, vorticity generated at the rate proportional to this cross product. Now let's take a little piece of a curved shock. This is a little piece of a curved shock, starting at a, smaller, a large angle and at a smaller angle here. On the upstream side of this, we have uniform flow arriving here. So on the upstream side, the pressure is constant along the shock and the density is constant along the shock. However, on the downstream side, with a strong shock, the density is constant, but the pressure decreases. That means that the lines of constant pressure within the shock have to exit the shock on the downstream side. That means that the density gradient is normal to the shock and the pressure gradient is a little bit down from normal. And so if I am a nice little element of fluid coming along without rotation, encounter the shock wave, go through the shock wave, I get a kick of angular momentum, which causes me to emerge with a finite rate of rotation. I should have said by when I saw the boundary layer, you remember that boundary layer was one millimeter thick and the velocity difference was 2000 meters per second. So the average vorticity in that boundary layer is uh, two million radians per second. So we want about a million radians per second or of that order. And the formula that gives us the vorticity at the downstream side is this, where R is the radius of curvature of the shock, U is the velocity uh, of the flow, beta is the shock angle, and epsilon is our friend, the density ratio. This number at the place where we get the maximum vorticity generated is approximately four. So in order to get a million radians per second, we need a radius of curvature of the shock of about three millimeters. Now we can do that by just using that inviscid flow over here and chopping off the tip so that we get a blunt tip and therefore a bow shock. And this is shown here. This is a bit small. Maybe I can make it a bit bigger for you. Too big. So I, I chop off the tip and I get a curved shock wave here. You see my cursor, a curved shock wave, downstream of which we have a vorticity now. So we've generated vorticity not by the no slip condition but by a curved shock wave. Now, let me see. And lo and behold, we get exactly the same kind of behavior, even with the same frequency. Uh, we, we generate a vortex ring. Vortex ring grows. Vortex ring doesn't like to be stretched, wants to propagate to the left, gets trapped, opens up, its own bottleneck and flops over the edge uh, at the same rate as in the case when we generate the vorticity with the no slip condition. So it, it, this is therefore not a viscous phenomenon, but a vorticity phenomenon. I should say that if you have a steady flow, axisymmetric steady flow, then these streamlines are closed. But these streamlines are integral curves of the instantaneous velocity field 
and in an unsteady flow, they can spiral into or out of a focus in an instantaneous snapshot. So this is not an, an error, the fact that we have here spiral streamlines, but it's a manifestation of the unsteadiness. And then we can also at two strategic points, like halfway along cone one and halfway along cone two, we record the pressure. And here is the very nearly periodic pressure on cone one in red and on cone two in green. In the case of the sharp viscous flow, uh, in the case of the inviscid blunt flow, it takes a bit longer to get to a reasonably uh, periodic condition, but, and also it's not perfectly not not nearly as well periodic as the viscous case but it has the same frequency of about 600 microseconds per cycle now i want to jump ahead and show the boundary in one case in theta 1 theta 2 space we get a boundary that looks like this a loop which has a lower branch and an upper branch and the maximum theta one. I show this because I want to characterize flows in different regions of this map. Inside the loop, uh, the flow is unsteady. Outside the loop, it's steady. So let me show you some steady flows first at E, F, and G. Here, in the case of condition A with the length ratio one. So on the left, is condition G at the bottom here, which is actually uh, 25 and 55 degrees, which has been studied ad nauseam. Uh, you can see some features in this. Uh, the white line is the sonic line. The color indicates the velocity. So red is high, blue is low. So you see a sonic line here inside the boundary layer and at the edge of the separated region, and here again in the boundary layer. Then you see a sonic line uh, that encloses an island of subsonic flow, and in between them, there is this supersonic shock train, which drains the vorticity away and keeps things nice and steady. In position F, which is here in the map, we get the second manifestation of the steady flow, uh, which is with the separation localized along cone one, but we still have a supersonic shock train that makes it all the way through to the shoulder. This is not the case anymore at condition E, where the supersonic shock train stops with um, presumably a normal shock. And you can see uh, the features of these steady flows as just like my sketches. Now we do the same thing for the case with the length ratio 0.5, and much the same happens. Supersonic shock train, it makes it a bit further in this case of condition E. But the features are qualitatively the same. Now let me show you uh, that region of the 25 and 55 degrees where a lot of work has been done. Huge amount of work. Names, Holden, Olenichak, Candler, Levin, Theophilus, Nisley, Austin, and many more. And this has been mainly focusing on uh, checking up on computational work against experiment. The sensitive quantities are the separation length and the heat flux and skin friction distributions. This is a nice photo from uh, Andrew Nisley, uh, who did his work in T5. And I have, uh, I want to describe this. Here's the, what I call the cone one shock, the separation shock. And here is the separation streamline, which you cannot see here very well, but I'll show it in a video in a second. Here is the reattachment shock, 
and the shock train here is bounded by a shear layer which is actually turbulent in this case because the Reynolds number in this case is something like uh, one and a half orders of magnitude higher than mine. And here is the current two shock. These two features are artifacts of the visualization method, which is a line of sight integrating method. And this is an axisymmetric flow. So this here is actually an image of that shock on the sides behind and in front of the cone. And the other line here is a trace of the triple point of the of, of these three shocks coming together. Now let me show you a video of this flow. Okay, let's see. Uh, what's going on? And here it starts here and it goes for about one and a half or two milliseconds. So it's extreme slow motion. Now you can see the separation streamline and flow is pretty steady. The manifestation of the uh, of the free stream noise is the fluctuation in these features. So that's the end of one and a half milliseconds, pretty long one and a half milliseconds. Okay, so you can watch this for hours. Okay, where's my viewer? view full screen mode yeah, so much for that then i have to show you some snapshots of the unsteady flows in different regions in regions b c and d b c and d the flow is not as violently unsteady as in the region a or where i showed it up here even but it is the same mechanism. Vorticity is generated, accumulates in a vortex ring, vortex ring grows, opens up, and flops over the edge. These are temperature distributions. Blue is low, red is high. Now here is a pulsating flow at location A. Let me show you that again. A is here. Uh, and same thing we get this time i think i have here uh, what is it the uh, velocity distribution with black streamlines and again the vortex ring grows grows opens up flops over and the new one grows now i come to the results now is my time results so these are these loops for the different conditions a b c d now you can see uh, that the lower branch is totally dominated by the detachment angle which is shown as a thin black line in each case you can see that this is very nicely asymptoting to the thin black line uh, and that explains the lower branch of the loop the upper branch can be understood as follows. If I, for example, for example, if I consider the case A, which is the red line, and I'm at theta one equals 30, and I increase theta two until I get to the detachment angle, so it goes unsteady. Then when I go up here and I keep increasing the angle of the second cone, that pushes the shock wave further away and makes the sonic throat a bit bigger and it reverts back to steady flow because of that. In the case of the shorter second cone, the shock wave is not pushed up as much because L2 is much smaller. And so the, the 
transition to steady flow at the top end is later. So that is explains that upper branch. The fact that it is so, so uncannily uh, given by the detachment angle at the low branch suggests that we should stretch the coordinate between the detachment angle and 90 degrees in this fashion. And when we do this, all the lower branches fall on top of each other. And the upper branches where the error bars are pretty big, uh, if I were to draw uh, this line with a fat pen of the size of the error bar, it would be a single curve except for the purple one, which is Mach number two. So in the hypersonic range, this is practically a single curve. The same in the smaller second cone size. So for hypersonic flow with Reynolds number independence, uh, and I should say A primed, is the same condition as this with only twice the Reynolds number and the curves are not distinguishable from each other. The second factor of two in Reynolds number does nothing. And also since we have shown that this phenomenon is an unsteady one, uh, an uh, inviscid one, we can rule out the Reynolds number dependence. So my conclusion is for hypersonic flow, we have only three independent variables. That brings me to my conclusions, which are, I found the unsteadiness boundary, and if we want to ensure steady flow, we have to stay either below theta 2d or above 40 degrees with theta 1. Unsteadiness is an inviscid phenomenon, and the mechanism has been found. And in hypersonic flow, the boundary depends only on three parameters. Thank you.